Salutations! In this series, we will be going over peripatetic logic, which, along with grammar and rhetoric, is considered the very foundation of all classical education. Aristotle's logic was adopted by the scholastics and medieval philosophers, and thus formed the basis for Renaissance and early modern thought. If you wish to study Boethius, Averroes, Aquinas, Albertus Magnus, Spinoza, Kant, Descartes, Hegel, or Schopenhauer, it will be immensely useful for you to understand Aristotelian logic. Thanks, I'm glad to know. Knowledge equals gladness. Of course, it was also the system adopted by the later Platonists in opposition to Stoic logic, and it was considered a vital preparation for Platonic dialectic by Iamblichus. Aristotle's logic is found in a collection of five books called the Organon. Open up, Organon! But you're already inside. No excuses! And also in the fourth book of his Metaphysics. If you wish to explore the subject further after these videos, I recommend reading these and Porphyry's Isagogue, which is an introduction to the categories. You have likely encountered people who appeal to logic as an indistinct concept, without having any actual understanding of what logic is or what it entails. They tend to imagine that it means something vague like clever thinking, when in fact it is a specific discipline with strict rules, of which our unfortunate contemporaries are broadly ignorant. Logic is a lot like mathematics, but instead of numbers, it refers to subjects, predicates, and categories. You can put information into a logical argument, as you put numbers into a formula, and its structure produces a necessary result. The foundational principle of logic is the principle of non-contradiction, that is to say, that a proposition can only be true or false, it cannot be both or neither. Any argument consisting of propositions which contradict is inherently invalid. The most secure of all beliefs is that mutually contradictory statements cannot be jointly true. Subordinate to this is the principle of identity, which simply states that everything is itself. Me. Yes, you! I am me. A equals A and B equals B, just as 1 equals 1 and 2 equals 2. It is often expressed in the form, everything is what it is, everything isn't what it isn't, and nothing is neither or both. Therefore, any proposition in which A does not equal A is false. He's me, and I'm you. The basic unit of peripatetic logic is a term, which is either a subject or a predicate. For example, in the proposition, all dogs are furry, the term dogs is a subject, and the term furry is a predicate. However, in the proposition, all border collies are dogs, the term border collies is a subject, and the term dogs is a predicate. A proposition is a statement composed of a subject, a predicate, and either an affirmation or negation. It asserts either that the predicate belongs to the subject, or that it does not. For example, Peachy is an Englishman, consists of a subject, peachy, a predicate, Englishman, and an affirmation, is. While peachy is not a god, consists of a subject, peachy, a predicate, god, and a negation, is not. Not gods, Englishmen, which is the next best thing. Wherefore, a syllogistic proposition will be simply an affirmation or negation of something concerning something, after the above-mentioned mode. In addition to affirmative and negative, propositions can also be divided into universal or particular. The proposition, all men have souls, is universal, while the proposition, some men have souls, is particular. The particular proposition is subordinate to and contained by the universal one, since if the universal is true, then the particular is also true. But if the particular is true, then the universal may be true or false. The same principle also applies to negative propositions. Again, I call a term that into which a proposition is resolved, as for instance the predicate and that for which it is predicated, whether or not it is to be added or separated. Lastly, a syllogism is a sentence in which certain things being laid down, something else different from the premises necessarily results, in consequence of their existence. So terms make up propositions, and propositions make up syllogisms. Now, a syllogism is the equivalent of an equation in mathematics. A simple equation consists of two numbers with a relational sign followed by a result. A simple syllogism consists of two premises related by content, followed by a conclusion. If we have two and two, 
it necessarily follows that we have four. Let's try again, shall we? I have two beans, then I add two more beans. What does that make? A very small casserole. <laughs> Likewise, if the premises are true, then it necessarily follows that the conclusion is true. For example, Rasta Mouse is a mouse, all mice are mammals, therefore Rasta Mouse is a mammal. Or to boil it down to its simplest possible expression, A equals B, B equals C, therefore A equals C. If a syllogism has been constructed properly, then assuming that the premises are true, it is impossible for the conclusion to be false. This is what it means for a syllogism to be valid, which is not the same as the conclusion being true. As with mathematics, even if I perform a calculation correctly, if one of my input numbers was incorrect, the result will be incorrect too. For example, all ducks have feathers, Socrates is a duck, therefore Socrates has feathers. This is a valid syllogism because the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises, but one of these premises is false, and so is the conclusion. On the other hand, we have this. All men are bipeds, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is a biped. Not only is this syllogism valid, but its premises are also true. If this is the case, then we say that the argument is sound. You cannot beat it. If you have been paying close attention, you may have noticed that in all valid syllogisms, there is one term which is present in both premises, but not in the conclusion. This is called the mean or middle term. In our last example, the mean term was man. The mean term defines the relationship between the two other terms, linking them through affirmation or negation. When looking at an argument to determine its validity, one must pay attention to the mean term. One may encounter an argument in which the propositions are not actually linked together, because they do not contain the same term. For example, crows are black, Hugin is a raven, therefore Hugin is black. While the terms crow and raven are similar, they are not identical, and thus the argument is invalid. Notice that even though the argument is wrong, the correct conclusion was reached regardless. This can trick people into thinking that a similarly structured argument may yield correct results. Your logic is flawed, you come undone. Another vital element to observe regards the universal and the particular. The mean term must be used universally at least once. If we do not affirm anything of the mean term universally, then we are not actually saying anything about the mean term itself. As a result, the conclusion will not necessarily be true. We can test the particular and universal implications of a term by looking at the proposition in reverse. Again, since of affirmative and negative propositions some are universal, others particular, and others indefinite, it is necessary that the universal negative propositions of what is present should be converted in these terms. For instance, if no pleasure is good, then no good is pleasure. But an affirmative proposition must be converted not universally, but particularly, as if all pleasure is good, then some good is pleasure. In demonstration, let's look at an implied argument that has completely saturated almost all political discourse for the past 80 years. Hitler disagrees with me, all of my opponents disagree with me, therefore all of my opponents are Hitler. Yeah, everyone I don't like is literally Hitler, everyone except for me. The fact that this is fallacious when stated aloud is obvious, but why this is ought to be thoroughly articulated, since similar associations are made constantly. When the mean term is used universally with a second term, it is necessarily present with the other term. And when a third term is used universally with the mean term, it is necessarily present with that. This creates a condition of subordination, which becomes visible when we imagine the subject as dependent on its predicate. For instance, all houses require bricks, all bricks require clay, therefore all houses require clay. On the other hand, if we change the second proposition to something like this, all houses require bricks, all pubs require bricks, therefore all houses require pubs. Here, the mean term is not used universally at all. The Hitler argument is structured like this second invalid one. Both Hitler and opponent necessarily imply disagreement, but disagreement does not necessarily imply either of them. 
Now, the sort of people who think in this way are hardly going to be persuaded by you telling them about the logical invalidity of their rhetorical weaponry. But by understanding this, you can begin to improve your own critical thinking abilities and apply it to other arguments you see. That's all for today, but this series will be continuing. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.